chapter five. The house on Egypt Street became frantic with the activity as a Tulane family prepared for their voyage to England. Edward possessed a small trunk and Abilene packed it for him, filling it with his finest suits and several of his best hats and three pair of shoes. So all that before, he might, he might cut a fine figure in London. Before she placed him on the outfit in the trunk, she displayed it to him. Do you like this shirt with this suit? She asked him, or would you like to wear your black derby? You look very handsome in it. Should we pack it? And then finally, on a bright Saturday morning in May, Edward and Abilene and Mr. and Mrs. Tulane were all on board the ship, standing at the railing. Pellegrino was at the dock. On her head, she wore a floppy hat strung around her with flowers. She stared straight at Edward. Her dark eyes glowed. Goodbye, Abilene shouted to her grandmother. I love you. The ship pulled away from the dock. Pellegrino waved to Abilene. Goodbye, lady, she called. Goodbye. Edward felt something like damp in his ears. Abilene's tears, he supposed. He wished that she would not hold him so tight. To be clutched so fiercely often wrinkled his clothes. Finally, all the people on the landing, including Pellegrina, disappeared. Edward, for one, was relieved to not see her again. As to, as to be expected, Edward Tulane exacted much attention on board the ship. What a singular rabbit, said an elderly lady with pearls wrapped around her neck. She had bent down to look closely. Thank you, said Abilene. Several little girls on board gave Edward deep glances full of longing. They asked Abilene if, she, if they could hold her, hold him. No, said Abilene. I'm afraid he's not the kind of rabbit that likes to be held by strangers. Two young boys, brothers named Martin and Amos, took a particular interest in Edward. What does he do? Martin asked Abilene on their second day at sea. He pointed to Edward, who was sitting on a chair. He doesn't do anything, said Abilene. Does he wind up somewhere? No, he does not wind up. Then what's the point of him? The point is that he is Edward. That's not much of a point, said Amos. It's not, agreed Martin. And then after a long, thoughtful pause, he said, I wouldn't let anyone dress me like that. Me neither, said Amos. Do his clothes come off? Of course they do, said Abilene. He has many different outfits, and he takes his own pajamas, too. They're made of silk. Edward, as usual, was disregarding the conversation. A breeze was blowing off in the sea, and the silk scarf wrapped around his neck billowed out behind him. On his head, he wore a straw boater. The rabbit was thinking, he looks quite dashing. It came as a total surprise to him when he was grabbed off the deck of the chair first by his scarf and then by his jacket and then his pants. He heard his pocket watch hit the deck. Then he was held upside down. Look at him, said Martin. He's even got underwear. Take it off, no, shouted Abilene. Leave him alone. Edward was now paying attention. He was mortified, his fur everywhere. Give him to me, screamed Abilene. He's my rabbit. No, said Amos. He was clapping his hands. He asked his brother to throw him. He did. He tossed him. Please, cried Abilene, don't throw him. He's made of china. He will break. Martin threw him anyway. Edward was in the air. Only for a moment the rabbit had thought that looking like this in front of a shipload of strangers was the worst thing that could ever happen to him. But he was wrong. Being tossed in the air from one grubby hand to another felt so awful. Throw him back to me, called Martin. I'm over here, I'm open. Amos raised his arm, but just as he was getting ready to throw Edward, Abilene tackled him, shoving him in his head and his stomach. Edward did not go flying back into the arms of Martin. Instead, Edward Tulane went overboard. Chapter six. How does a China rabbit die? Can a China rabbit drown? Is my hat still on my head? These were the questions that Edward asked himself as he went sailing off the deck into the blue sea. The sun was high in the sky and from what seemed to be a very long way, Edward heard Abilene call his name. Edward, she shouted, come back, 
come back of all the ridiculous things to shout, thought Edward. As he tumbled over through the air, he managed to catch one last glimpse of Abilene. She was standing on the deck of the ship, holding onto the railing with one hand. In her other hand, was a lamp? No, it was a ball of fire. No, Edward realized it was his pocket watch. Abilene held it in her hand as if she was holding it up high. My pocket watch, he thought, I need that. And then Abilene disappeared from the view and the rabbit hit the water with such a tremendous force that his hat came off his head. That answers the question though, Edward, as he watched his hand, hat dance away into the wind and it began to sink and he sank and he sank and he sank. He kept his eyes open the whole time, not because he was brave, because he had no choice. His eyes were painted on. He witnessed the blue water turning green and then blue again. There's a picture. So here's the ship and there's Edward. Edward went down, down. He said to himself, I'm going to drown, certainly. I would have done so by now. Oh, if I'm going to drown, I certainly would have done so by now. Far above him, the ocean liner with Abilene aboard it sailed blithery on and the China rabbit landed on the ocean floor. Face down and there his head was in the muck. He experienced his first genuine and true emotion. Edward was afraid. Chapter seven. He told himself that certainly Abilene would come find him. This, Edward thought, is much like waiting for Abilene to come home from school. I will pretend that I'm in the dining room on the house on Egypt Street, waiting for the little hand to move, waiting for the little hand to move to the three and the big hand to move to the twelve. If only I had my watch, then I would know for sure. But it doesn't matter. She'll be here very soon. Hours passed. Days. Weeks. Months. Abilene did not come. Edward, for lack of anything better to do, began to think. He began to think about the stars. He remembered what they looked like from his bedroom window. What made them shine so brightly? He wondered and wondered. Were they still there shining? Even though he couldn't see them? Never in my life, he thought, have I ever been so far away from the stars. He considered, too, the fate of the beautiful princess who had become a warthog. Why had she become a warthog? because the ugly witch turned her into one, that's why. And then the rabbit thought about Pellegrino. He felt in some way he could not explain himself. He felt in some way he couldn't explain to himself she was responsible for what happened to him. It was almost as if it was she, not those boys, who had thrown Edward overboard. She was like the witch in the story. No, she was the witch in the story. True, she did not turn him into a warthog, but the punishment was just the same. On the 297th day of Edward's ordeal, a storm came. The storm was so powerful that it lifted Edward off the ocean floor and led him into a wild, spinny, crazy dance. The water pummeled him and lifted him up and shoved him back down. Help, thought Edward. The storm in its ferocity actually flung him all the way out of the sea. The rabbit glimpsed for a moment the light of an angry and bruised sky. The wind rushed through his ears. It sounded to him like Pellegrino was laughing, but before he had time to appreciate being ab above water, he was tossed back down into the depths. Up and down, back and forth he went until the storm wore itself out. And Edward, and Edward saw he was at the beginning again. Slow descent to the ocean floor. Oh, help me, he thought. I can't go back there. Help me. But still he went down, down, down. And suddenly, the great wide of a net from a fisherman reached out and grabbed the rabbit. The net lifted him higher and higher until there was almost an unbearable explosion of light and Edward was back in the world, lying on the deck of the fish, surrounded by, look, the, the, lying on the deck of the ship, surrounded by fish. And yeah, what's this? said a voice. Ain't no fish, said another voice, that's for sure. The light was so brilliant that it was hard for Edward to see, 
But finally, shapes appeared out of the light and then faces, and Edward realized he was looking up at two young men. Two men. One was an old man, one was a young man. Looks like some kind of toy, said the old man. He picked up Edward by his front paws, considering him. A rabbit, I reckon. It's got whiskers and rabbit ears, or at least the shape of a rabbit ear. Yeah, sure, a rabbit toy, said the younger man, and he turned away. I'll take it home to Nellie. Let her fix it up. Give, give it to some child. The old man placed Edward carefully on a crate, positioning him so that he was sitting up and could look out at the sea. Edward appreciated the courtesy of this small gesture, but he was heartily sick of the ocean. There you go, said the old man. As they made their way back to shore, Edward felt the sun on his face and the wind blowing through the little bit of fur he had left on his ears. Something filled in his chest. It was a wonderful feeling. He was so glad to be alive. Look at that rabbit, said the old man. Looks like he's enjoying the ride, don't it? Uh, yep, said the other man. In fact, Edward Tulane was so happy to be back among the living, he didn't even care that they referred to him as it. <laughs>